Oh, Shahan? Florida. You know what they say about Texas? Wouldn't be any Texas without Tennessee. That's right. I'm not even actually from originally from Tennessee. I just like t telling out the Texans. I used to go there all the time for work. <clears throat> all right. Morning. Morning. Where, where's Johnny at, Jerry? Okay. All right. Well, I think you're in luck. I believe Pastor Lawson is on the mend, and according to Brother Barry, he uh, should be here. And So I know that's who you came to see if you're visiting. You didn't come to see me. Well, you should have come to see the Lord, as Barry preached on Wednesday. However, we understand, you understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> so, okay. Well, folks, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, it's two minutes early, but I think everyone's here that's going to be here. So, uh, Brother Barry, would you open us up, please? My Father, we bow in your presence, Lord, we thank you for just another opportunity to come into your house. Lord, to gather around your precious and valuable word, to be with our brothers and sisters, I pray you touch my dear brother this morning. God, I pray you put a hedge of battle. I pray you give him that unction and that anointing to be able to teach your precious book. I pray you give us receptive hearts, Lord. Open us up so we can receive what you give out to us. I pray for our pastor. I pray, my Father, that you would keep your hand upon him. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint him in the days he stands to preach. And for all that you do, I'll be careful. Thou might as well be here and give me the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right, so we're going to begin teaching the book of Romans. Um, as you see up there, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Um, so some preliminaries about the book of Romans, which um, it's important that you understand these things. Uh, the book of Romans is a doctrinal book. It is the foundation uh, <clears throat> for what Paul sets forth in the New Testament. Um, it teaches us that you're justified by faith plus nothing. Okay. Um, Galatians teaches you that you're kept by faith plus nothing, uh, but Romans is the doctrinal book here, and if you don't get Romans right and, and your doctrine straight and you don't filter everything through Pauline doctrine, then the rest of the Bible is going to be uh, seemingly, seemingly on the surface is going to contradict. And so, so here in the church age, and we've got to understand what Paul lays forth for the church, Okay, in which we're, that's where we're at. Okay, uh, the book is written somewhere between 58 to 50 or to 60 A.D., depending on the um, scholars. Or, you know, some of the some of them have it 58, some of them have it 60. Uh, Schofield has it at 60 A.D. It really the, the the main point you want to take from that is that it's written before Acts 26, before Paul goes to Rome. Okay, and so why, why that's important as well, you have some groups which you'd call a hyper-dispensationalist. They'll teach that the, the church started in Acts 28. That's Bollinger. Um, well, obviously, Paul wrote the doctrinal book on the grace of God before Acts 28. And so there's some things there that you can refute with the scripture. But that's why chronology is important when you're teaching the Bible and, and beginning to read the Bible and study the Bible. Chronology is very important. And we're to play some of these epistles. And you're never going to nail these things down 100% um, with, you know, uh, sitting there and say, well, somebody might say 58, you might say 60. It's not really anything worth falling out over. Just the main point is that it was written before Acts 26, before he goes to Rome, okay? And so Paul begins his writing here, and like I said, it's a doctrinal book, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, right? And so we can look at Romans as a doctrinal book um, for reproof. You could look at Galatians. Um, he, he has to reprove the Galatians because they were caught up into Judaism. Um, you know, reproof, correction, same thing with Galatians, instruction of righteousness. You can look at Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and, and some of those books where he's giving exhortation on how to have instruction of righteousness. And so all scripture is given by inspiration. It's all profitable. Now, um, let me just do this here. Can you still hear me? Hear me? So whenever you begin to study the Bible and you understand that there is different applications of scripture, 
Uh, I always teach this why, because it's so important, okay? So you can understand that one application of Scripture is a historical application, okay? So you might look at the book of Exodus. Those things really happened. They took place in history, okay? You might look at the uh, seven churches in Asia Minor that John writes to. Those are historical churches, okay? So you can look down. We can teach church history looking back, and we can use those things in a practical sense to teach church history. So, his, so historically, you can say, okay, well, what happened back here in Exodus is history. It is a fact that God parted the Red Sea. That's a miracle. It wasn't the Reed Sea. It wasn't any of those kind of things. It was historically accurate, and the book is accurate, okay? Um, this, we have doctrinal, okay, which we're going to be talking a lot of in the book of Romans slash prophetic. What I mean by that is doctrinal slash prophetic, well, we just talked about Exodus, right? So the things that took place to those Jews and the giving of the law and all those uh, things that the Lord is doing historically and, and doctrinally with that Jew, who he was dealing with, that group, but also prophetically because the things that took place in Exodus are going to take place again in Daniel's 70th week. So he's going to feed the children of Israel with, with manna once again. He's going to feed them with that bread that Satan tempts him to do in, in Luke 4 and Matthew 4. Okay, So there's a prophetic aspect as well, and you'll find that. I'm not going to get into Revelation. Okay, And then you have a practical or spiritual. Some people call it spiritual application. Okay, So there is a, that's an instruction in righteousness. So everything in the Bible is not necessarily written to you, but it's written for you. You may have heard that said. So the practical application, and you'll see Paul do it many times as we go through the book of Romans, how he'll take something from the Old Testament that was doctrinally, it was pointed at that Jew, for instance, in the Old Testament or in the millennial reign of Christ, and he practically applies it to the church. Okay? And so you've got to be careful, and that's where we talk about right divisions of the Bible and right applications of Scripture. You have to understand those three applications. And this is where a lot of folks go wrong. I just mentioned one of the groups the hyper-dispensationalists, where, where they go wrong is they take everything and they say, ah, that's to the Jew. That's not to the church. I understand what they're talking about when they're talking about doctrinal, but however, you lose the instruction of righteousness when you start cutting things out of the Bible and say, well, this doesn't apply. To well, yeah, but there's still instruction of righteousness. I can still get something out of the Gospels. You better believe you can. There's all kind of types and things in the Old Testament Calvin, he throws out 80% of the Old Testament, okay? He doesn't even listen to it, okay? So you miss those character types in the Old Testament, whether it's Joab, whether it's Abishai, whether, I don't, any of them, pick them. God has given, given you those things so that for your, your learning and for your admonition. And so when you're studying the Bible, you have to keep those things into, in, in, in account, okay? You have to keep those things in check in your mind, and you can't get so hyper-focused on one thing that you lose the practical that God's trying to teach you. Okay? And so Paul, as he goes down the Romans road, you know, and he did his ministry, um, he always brought it back to the practical. Okay? And so the application of the scripture was always a practical application. He was always teaching things and trying to uh, further Christ's ministry, okay, through the practical and teach people. So people all the time get, get so focused on all the what we call dispensations and listen you can have all your dispensations lined up correctly but your disposition is not very good amen and so you can get a head full of knowledge but your heart's wrong so you have to you, there, there's got to be a balance there's got to be some temperance as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 so keep those things in mind okay um, so we're going to teach Romans and get, get our doctrines hopefully and not that you haven't got them you know I'm not here to Say everything you've ever learned is wrong. And we're just going to look expositionally through the Scripture and let the Lord work it out. Okay? Um, so we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture, and we're going to give the, the best thing we can do here, and we're going to try to do what the Lord's given me to do. Okay? So let's go back to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Let's look at the first thing Paul says here. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. Well, here's a great three-point outline if you're listening. There's, there's a great lesson to be learned here. The first thing that Paul calls himself is a servant. As a favorite thing that he called himself, he was a servant. Yes, he was an apostle, 
but he was a servant first. Let me, let's go back to Acts chapter 9. Let's look at his conversion. Acts chapter 9. Notice the calling. The light shines around about him in verse 3, Acts 9, 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's the first thing he says to him. He's a servant. What will you have me to do? You know, God's man, or however you want to look at those things, a servant always, he hears his master's call, and he does what his master tells him to do. The best thing that you can be as a Christian is a servant, right? And so let's look at some examples. Let's go back over here to uh, 1 Samuel. Go back to 1 Samuel. Obviously, you, you can, we can look at a lot of different examples. Moses is another one. He's called from that burning bush. <clears throat> Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. Look at verse 8 for sake of time. 1 Samuel 3, 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. <clears throat> so Samuel went and lay down in his place. So you understand that he, was, he heard the call. Number one, you've got to be close enough to hear the call. Okay, and when the Lord did call, and he was young in the Lord, he didn't yet know him as it says here in the scripture, but he didn't have that relationship yet. But when Eli says that to him, he, lay, he lays down, and then the Lord calls him, and he answers that call. What, what will you have me to do, Lord? Whatever it is. So a servant hears his master, and he does what his master says. Look at 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Look what the Lord calls David. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Look at verse 5. This is the Lord speaking. The word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, verse 4, Go and tell my servant David. Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt build me a house for me to dwell in. He's saying it in a question form. Shalt thou build me a house to dwell in? Look at verse, uh, let's see here, look down here at verse 8. Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David. Okay, so twice the Lord says my servant David, and you'll see in this chapter ten times that David says, look at verse, for instance, look at verse 19. This was yet a, little, a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's, uh, of thy servant's house for a great while to come. Verse 20, and what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. Okay, so David was God's servant. He did what God said to do. Okay, so that's a great, um, great principle to learn about being a, you know, in whatever ministry that you have, it's about doing what God told you to do. It's not about, uh, you know, making yourself look good or anything like that. Okay, it's about doing what God said to do. So Paul, he exemplified that in, in his ministry. So we understand he was first a servant. So we just established in Acts chapter 9, what Lord, what thou, what, what thou had me to do. Look what he does, get, does next. Go up to uh, Acts chapter 9. Back to Acts chapter 9. This is after the baptism and the scales fall off of his eyes. And look what he does. Number one, the Lord just tells him to go down there and sit in the city and wait. And Ananias comes to him. Look at verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So he says what the master would have him to say. He doesn't say what he wants to say. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. As he says in the church of Corinth here. 
1 Corinthians 2, 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, did Paul know some more things than that? You better believe he did. But he wasn't trying to impress men. He's going to get down to brass tacks. First thing they need, Jesus Christ, Him crucified. We'll get into the deeper stuff as we go along, as you mature. But right now, this is what you need to hear. Okay? All right, so that's what he does. So he goes and preaches Jesus Christ, okay? So he's called to be an apostle. That's a calling, obviously. You don't just say, I'm going to be an apostle. Uh, a lot of times you get that today, um, I'm going to go be a priest. Well, who called you to do that? Did God call you? I can, I can guarantee you that I wasn't the one calling myself to preach. That was the Lord. And most folks that have been called to preach look at the Lord and go, Lord, are you sure you're talking to me? Right? Uh, Lord, I'm not worthy. I didn't ask if you're worthy. Just will you go? Got to be willing. Amen. Who is he called to preach? The ones that are willing to go. Is there not a cause? That's the Lord, that's the verse of Scripture that God used to call me to preach. Is there not a cause? Well, yeah, the Lord. Okay, then get busy. All right? And so we see that here. So he's called to be an apostle. Okay? And then he's separated unto the gospel of God. Go over here to Acts 13. Notice that Paul, when he gets, he gets converted, he goes and preaches a little bit. Then God has him go down to Arabia for about 40 days. And then he comes back up to Damascus, about three years of time period. And he kind of sits there. And then here comes Barnabas, uh, his name's Son of Consolation. And he comes and he presents him to the, to the other apostles to kind of give him a you know, just to, to help him out because obviously he'd been the one killing Christians just right before that. So he's kind of giving him a vote of confidence and he goes before these men and he just learns from Barnabas and he serves the older man of God and he's just an errand boy taking, taking the money up on the first day of the week for the mission offerings and all those things and he wasn't a big shot. He wasn't trying to be a big shot, okay? But look here in Acts 13. Brother Lucas, you preached, what, Sunday about uh, having to clean the tools in concrete, starting at the bottom. That's what Paul did. He's just a tent maker. Now, he's a Pharisee and all those things. But look at Acts 13, 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Luci Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein to I've called them. Okay? So you see the separation. He's now being put into the full-time ministry. Okay? That's not just something that you decide to do. That's something that's got to be called, and then God will separate that person. That's what sanctification is about. You get sanctified by the Holy Ghost when you're saved, judicially speaking, doctrinally speaking, but there's a daily sanctification that takes place. Okay? So let's go back to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. And Paul also gives you a great um, lesson. This is the kind of the way the Lord, the order in which the Lord does things. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Notice he's separated unto the gospel. So this is a principle, it's a good one to teach. First, you must be separated unto. Secondly, you can be separated from things. A lot of times people try to get this thing out of order. They try to get separated from things before they're separated unto God. Can't do it that way. Okay, the Lord, He's got to be on the throne before you can get separated from things. Look at Numbers chapter 6. Look at the principle from Genesis to Revelation. These are principles, right? Numbers chapter 6. This is the Nazarite. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow, vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. 
He shall, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. Shall drink no vinegar and so on and so forth. That's a vow of the Nazarite. Notice the order. Separate unto, separated from things. Okay? A lot of folks, they get that one backwards and they wonder why they can't get victory over certain things because you didn't get separated unto God. Okay? You have a problem with whatever it might be, start here. He's got to be more important than the thing. And then God will give you the victory. It's like I taught a couple weeks ago. you got to understand salvation versus discipleship. Okay? That's, that's a huge one. Okay? You, got, you receive Christ. But this right here has to do with discipleship. Paul got separated into God, and therefore he put away other things. He said, I can't all things but dumb, that I may win Christ. How did he do that? Because he got separated unto God. Yeah. Right? You got some kind of besetting sin, and you want to get victory over that thing? Get separated unto him. You better get in that book. You're not going to get victory if you don't get in that book. Okay? It's our job to catch them. It's, jo it's God's job to clean them up. He'll clean you up. He'll clean you up with that book. He'll get you straightened out. He got me straightened out. Okay? And so those things begin to work in a man, and you can see those things in Paul. So that's a great principle that you learn from the Scripture uh, that we just showed in Numbers chapter 6. So remember that in your own personal life. You see the practical? See the practical application there? That's so important, okay? Because um, all the prophetic stuff is great, but man, if it doesn't help you now, that daily bread not doing you a whole lot of good. Okay. Amen? Okay. Now look at over here, uh, verse 2. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. All right. See these Scriptures up here. I've got, I've got just a couple of them. There's obviously more than this in the Scripture, and if you can't see it, um, I don't want to move up, I guess. Um, the folks on the internet, they could probably see it better because they got a camera. But look here, Genesis 3.15 and Isaiah 7.14, okay? And then you have the New Testament verse that correlates the fulfilling of these verses here, okay? So Genesis 3.15, let's, let's look at it. Some of you probably know this like the back of your hand. <clears throat> but however, let's just take a look at it and the fulfillment of it. And I will put enmity between thy seed, or between uh, thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now we understand the woman does not have seed. That seed is the Holy Ghost. Okay, and that comes and incarnates. Uh, he incarnates himself, and that's Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah seven fourteen. Talking about the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay? So everybody's getting ready to celebrate Christmas. Even though they probably don't believe Isaiah 7, 14. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Let's look at the fulfilling of it. Matthew 1, 23. He's quoting Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God manifest in the flesh. Okay? It's prophesied. Did they understand all those things in the Old Testament, those Jews, those prophets? No, they did not. Okay, go to 1 Peter 1, 10. I'll show you. 1 Peter 1.10. 1 Peter 1.10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand, number one, the sufferings of Christ, number two, and the glory that should follow. That's the first advent and the second advent right next to each other. Okay? Sufferings first, then he reigns. Amen? So that was in them when they, when they prophesied, when they wrote these things. They didn't understand everything they were writing or, 
uh, what God was showing them, but God said to write it, and they were God's men, so they wrote it down, even though it didn't make a whole lot of sense to them. Okay, Lord, put it down. So that's it. There's fulfilling of the Scripture, Matthew 123. Let's go to Isaiah 53, 12. I'm not going to take time to do every one of these because there's more things I'd like to, to teach on, but Isaiah 53, 12. Isaiah 53, 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, right? Look over at John 19, 18. John 19, 18. Wherefore they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. That's what you just heard prophesied in Isaiah 53, 12. Okay, I want you to notice uh, there's four, three different references right here, or two of them right here. Psalm 22. Anybody who knows their Bible knows what Psalm 22 is about. It's about the cross. Okay? Um, all these, there's a lot of references in the Psalms pointing to most all of it's pointing to either his first advent or second advent, okay? And so if, if you want to copy those down, and those are just a couple references, okay, we're going to move on and because we'll get caught up looking at all the references and we don't want to do that. But let's look at Romans 1-2 again. Look at it says, verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, According to the flesh. All right. Everyone had time to write this down. If not, you can get with me afterward, okay? All right, so we're going to study this thing out because this will help you. When you're talking about the bloodline of Christ and all that, concerning his son, and according to the flesh, he's the seed of David. All right. So, seed of David, let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham... Look at verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king. We understand Matthew's the book of the king. Okay, this is just like uh, Genesis. This is a generation, right? <clears throat> All right, so talking about David the king, and it goes back to, to Abraham, uh, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So this lineage here is going to go back to Abraham. Look at verse 11. And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time that they were carried away to Babylon. <laughs> Okay, now look down at verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. All right, so what you're reading here, and you'll see it right here back in verse 6. David begat Solomon, so and so forth. So what you have, so Joseph comes from Solomon. Okay? All right, so let's go. Now, the problem with that is, go back to Jeremiah 22. Jeremiah 22. <clears throat> I just read you about this man, Jeconias. <clears throat> Jeremiah 22, 28. Is this man, Kenai, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel where and is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed are cast into, the, into a land which they know not. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Who's that written to? Everybody. Right? Thus saith the Lord, write ye, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So what's cut off? 
Solomon's line. Okay? He's called the son of David. Okay? I think Pastor even talked about this a little bit last week. So we got two different lines. We got Matthew 1, we got Luke 3. Okay? Go to Luke 3. Luke chapter 3. where a lot of times they'll try to say, well, the Bible contradicts it, all that nonsense. You've got to be a Bible student, okay? Not a scholar. Got to blind your eyes. Look at uh, Luke 3, 23. And Jesus began, himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now, who did it say Joseph's father was in Matthew 1? A man by the name of Jacob. It says over here it's Heli. So what do you do with that? Say so you have to understand about how that the Lord and how the Bible considers people somebody's son. Okay, you have a if you if you have children or you are married to somebody else, you are somebody's daughter-in-law or son-in-law, or they are your son-in-law or daughter-in-law. Right? That's where you get that from. This man Heli, this is Mary's father. He's called the son-in-law of. He lied. He called his son. Legally, he's his son. Okay, because flesh joined flesh. Now, they're, now they became one. Okay, now let's look at verse 31. So this is, and this goes all the way back to Adam. Okay, this bloodline goes all the way back to Adam. Look at verse 31. Which was the son of Melia, which was the son of Manan, which was the son of Mathatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Okay. So we've got this over here, Nathan. You can find him in 2 Chronicles 5.14. You can find him over in, in, um, in 2 Samuel. Okay, that's Nathan. That's another one of his sons. So that's where Mary comes from. She comes from Nathan's line. Okay? So he's the son of David according to the flesh, but through Mary. A virgin shall conceive. He cuts him off over here, Jeconias. He calls him what? Kaniah. Jeconias is what he's called, but he cuts off that J-E because that has to do with Jehovah. So he cuts that off. He says, I'll call that man Kaniah. He's not going to be connected with me for the wicked things he did. Okay? Here's another nugget for you. You'll see it over there. Just Josiah begets Jeconias. Well, Josiah begets Jehoiakim, and he begets Jeconias. What happened? Well, who messed with the book? Jeremiah 36, who knows their Bible? Took it, cut out things he didn't like out of the Bible. What happened? He messed with the book. He took his name out of the book. Mm, makes you think about that book of life, doesn't it? Okay? So anyway, so he's a right this man childless. It's got to come through here. It's got to come through Mary. So a virgin shall conceive. It's got to come through her. So she fulfills... The prophecy right there. He's got to sit on the throne. Okay? But you see, the thing is, is they couldn't work that thing out. They couldn't understand. All they had to do is believe the book. So when he shows up, his name means God with us. We talk about Christ the man, right? The son of man, the son of man, the son of man. What you have Luke was that the gospel of Luke oftentimes is connected with the man, Christ Jesus, right? Oftentimes we look at that and we say, well, that's, that's his humanity. Yes, it is. However, go back to Daniel. So when he would call himself, that was his favorite thing he'd call himself, the son of man, son of man. He wasn't just talking about his humanity. Look at um, Daniel seven thirteen, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man came to the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should, should serve him. His dominion, dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So when he calls himself the Son of Man, he's declaring his deity. That's what, okay, so Matthew 24, you'll see that again. What's that? That's the second advent. That Jew was waiting on that. So when he says son of man, 
He's not just talking about his humanity. He's talking about his deity. Because that's who's coming to rule and to reign with a rod of iron from Jerusalem. The same place they're fighting over right now, or about to. They're in Gaza, Gaza right now. Eventually it's going to move up to Jerusalem. And all the world's going to come against that Jew. And God's going to step on him like a wine press. Revelation 14. He's going to gather all the nations. And he's going to step on them. Amen? So guess what? We win. If you're in Christ, you win. If you're not in Christ, you better get in him. That floods are coming. You better get in the ark. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Okay, let's go back to Romans chapter 1 before I get to preaching. Romans chapter 1. So we understand how this lineage worked. So if somebody comes to you and says, well, the Bible contradicts, you just take them, just take them through the bloodlines, take them through the Bible, show them how the Bible's 100% accurate. All right, and verse uh, 4, declared be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Ah, so in order to believe in the resurrection, you must believe in a virgin birth. Because without the virgin birth, he could not come up. Because he would have had corruptible blood in him. It's logical. It takes faith to believe it. But you have to, what's the scripture say? He's de declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So when you believe on Christ, you believe that he, was, he died for our sins, according to the scripture, and he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. You can't believe that without believing the virgin birth. All right? Let's go here to uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. Which all the new Bibles, and I'm going to get flack on the internet for this because I saw some of the comments last time I taught about Acts 8.37. And they try to say, well, that was the, inserted by the King James translators and everything else. No, it was not. Look, Just same as this one. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy... Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What's the new Bible say? He who is manifest in the flesh. It's God in the flesh, right? Let's see here. Justified in the spirit. What did he just talk about in Romans 1, 4? Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So the spirit bared witness that he's the son of God. Amen? All right, let's go to... John 19. John 19, verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw that, and, and he that saw it bare record. And his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. So with that centurion, that Gentile dog, witness to everybody else was that he was the Son of God. Forth without came blood and water. Now let me ask you a question. When Noah built that ark, <clears throat> there was three levels to it. How'd they get in that ark? Where was the entrance of that ark? It's in the side. What's that ark a type of? Jesus Christ. How do you get in the ark? Through the blood. Amen? See so the type? Got in through the side. Notice the blood in the water. Go to 1 John. Go to 1 John. Now first let's go to John 3. John chapter 3. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
People at Church of Christ will take that and say, well, that's water baptism. No. What's he talking about? He's talking about the, fear, the physical birth is a water birth. Look at the verse, next verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's, he's right there. He's defining what the water is. It's natural birth. He's born of the seed of David according to the flesh. He could not die for your sins if he was not that, if he was not born in the flesh. He could not be that sacrifice. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In the, right? That's what he says. In the volume of the book it is written, had to come in the flesh, had to be the Lamb of God. Not like these Arians and every, everyone else, and he swooned on the cross, and well, this Holy Spirit came upon him, and then he left him. No, he's God in the flesh, saith the Scripture. How do I get saved? Because I believe on the, the Son of God. <clears throat> Amen? All right, so we're talking about water and the blood. And go to 1 John 5. Who wrote, who wrote 1 John? Same guy that wrote John. 1 John 5, verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. He'll guide you into all truth, right? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Every new Bible takes it out. Amen. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. See that? Justified in the Spirit. There's your witness. He said, that's true. Okay? He couldn't come up if he wasn't God. Go to Acts 20. Anybody got a Schofield reference Bible in here? Maybe if we have time, you can see what Schofield, he changed it. He, he does not believe in that authority of 1 John 5, 7. If you look at his notes, he said that thing was inserted. Where's he getting that from? All the so-called scholars. Amen. Go to uh, first, you know, where's that? Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with what? His own blood. God's blood. In the Old Testament, it was the blood of who? Bulls and goats. Okay? In the New Testament, it's the Lamb of God, the real one. These, their blood's not eternal. Therefore, it couldn't take away sin eternally. His blood's eternal. Therefore, it can take away your sin eternally. Right? This would just push it off every year. That's the Day of Atonement. Okay? But this right here, he offered himself once. You know how many times the word atonement shows up in your New Testament? One time. Romans 5.11. You'd think it'd show up more, right? You'd think it'd be in Hebrews. It's in Romans 5.11. You know how many times it shows up in the Old Testament? 81 times. Continually. Year after year. But in the New Testament, that word atonement shows up one time. Your sacrifice for sins forever. Okay, so it's God's blood we're talking about here. All right, that's who Jesus Christ is. God in the flesh. You know, I didn't know that when I was a lost man. First time I ever heard that was from a King James Bible. Didn't know that. Hear about Jesus Christ and celebrate Christmas. Didn't realize he's God in the flesh. Didn't even understand why he came to die. He came to die to pay for my sin. The just for the unjust. Okay? Amen? All right, go back to Romans. Just got just a second here. Romans chapter 1, verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power. You have, as many as received Him, to them gave He what? Power to become the sons of God, even then that believe on His name. The power of the resurrection resides in you if you're born again. You can't go up without the Holy Ghost being inside of you. Look at Romans uh, 8. All this fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man, he's not your father if you're not in Christ. Amen. Romans 8 9, But be ye not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Notice the capital S. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He doesn't know you. Once you get born again, you're known of God, as it says in Galatians. Before that, he didn't know you. Now that you're known now, because why? Now you're in the family. But before that, you were outside the commonwealth of Israel, aliens, as he says in Ephesians. Okay? So we have to understand that. So that power that resides in you is the power of the resurrection. That's what's going to bring you up someday. According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Okay? So once again, cannot you, you have to believe in the virgin birth in order to believe that resurrection. Because if he didn't have God's blood, he wouldn't have come up. He would have stayed down. Just look at look at the uh, Acts. Look at Acts. Uh, Peter's preaching over here in Acts two. Look at Acts two thirty. Now two twenty nine. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, just like Romans 1, 3, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing as this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, and neither his flesh did see corruption. It did not decay. Like your our flesh decays. This saith, or this Jesus hath God raised up, where, where, or whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, in being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he him, saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou in my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So obviously David's not speaking of himself, he's speaking of Christ, that he was going to raise up someday. Amen? So that's what he's talking about. Now there was another thing I was going to bring up. My mind slipped me. What was that? Um, so we have to understand that that's what David, that's what Peter's preaching there. He's preaching about the resurrection. He's pointing back to the Old Testament saying, you see that right there? He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's not talking about himself. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, so that's the power of the resurrection that resides in every born-again believer. And um, I think we're going to leave it there in Romans 1-4. We'll pick it up again next week, uh, Lord willing, in Romans 1-5. Okay. Any questions? Leave time for questions. And I might think of something I was going to say. Be, be careful. I'll stay up here all day. All right. No other questions? Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Father, Lord God, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, uh, uh, the anointing, Lord, to be able to teach. And thank you for that, Lord. And just, um, I just pray that it uh, edifies the saints and glorifies your son. Let's pray for the service today. Pray for pastor as he comes to break the bread of life. And pray for all those that are visitors today. Just give them travel mercies wherever they're heading back to. And just uh, we thank you for all those that uh, watched today. And I pray that uh, they were edified and they got something and uh, maybe learned something. And Father, we just thank you. Lord Jesus, now we pray. Jesus, we ask it. Amen. All right. Should be twenty two twenty eight. Let me look.
Yep, 28 through 30. Mm-hmm. You're welcome.
Good morning. Welcome everybody to Temple Baptist Church of Fountain City. If you're visiting with us, uh, you are our honored guest. And uh, I'm telling you, I want to encourage you uh, to come out and hear Brother Tony during Sunday school. Uh, I'm telling you, it's excellent, excellent. Uh, enjoyed it. Enjoyed the Sunday school time this morning. All right, let's have the uh, choir, if they will, to come up. We'll get ready to uh, sing, begin our worship service. While they're coming up, uh, turn to page number 390. We'll get ready to sing in just a minute uh, when I get some backup. church hymnal page uh, turn to page number 390 at the bottom my hope is built I can remember being as sick as I was this past week while you were having prayer meeting Wednesday night my head was splitting open I was bones every bone in my body seemed like it was aching but I got through it thank God and here I am amen. amen amen I appreciate you praying for me have anybody visiting with us this morning first time we'd like if you raise your hand all right good night got a bunch of folks here in the middle we want to give you a card let you fill it out drop it in the plate and it passes in a moment I want you to make yourself right at home with us. Where y'all from here? Vidalia, Georgia. Vidalia, Georgia. Have y'all got any onions down there, brother? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, anyone else in here? You folks there? Yes. South Dakota. South Dakota. All right. Well, good to have you. Good to have you. Don't they have a Don't they have a mountain out there in South Dakota somewhere? <laughs> All right. Somebody else with us? Yes, sir. Gainesville, Georgia. All right, good. Two from Georgia. Yes, sir. Texas. Texas. Amen. What part of Texas are you from? San Antonio. San Antonio. All right, brother. You're out there where all the history is located. Good to have you. Anybody else with us this morning, first time? 
Well, you folks make yourself right at home with us. We're glad to have you. Folks watching by the Internet as we live stream this, join in with us. You're part of us. We consider you part of our church. Yes, so many of you have no church home, nowhere to go. You're in a desert, and we welcome you here to Temple Baptist Church. May the good Lord bless you. We'll meet again this evening, 6 o'clock, for the evening service. You all keep that in mind, and ask the good Lord to bless today. Thank God that we're here. Amen. Amen. All right. Lord bless you.
heard the choir this morning. I tell you, man, they fire me up. Uh, just watching the smiles and, and, and seeing them sing from their heart, man. That's what it's all about. It's making a joyful noise from your heart to the Lord. Amen? All right, we'll stand up as the choir comes down and fellowship together. for you. The Lord shall fight for you and ye should hold your peace. Exodus 14, 13. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it'd be a good time. Bring them on up. What's her name? Claire. Claire? Okay. to do that now. I'm telling you right now. I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> All right, let's have the ushers come up here. We'll take up the morning offering. That was good. <laughs> Amen. Hmm. Folks, we're already into December now. Yes, December. It'll be a good month for the Lord to come back. How many think that? Yeah? Oh, yeah. December will be a good month. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Jones, will you lead us in prayer? Lord, thank you for being in your house today, Lord. Lord, pray you be with the pastor as he brings the message, Lord. Pray you be with the heart. Pray you open up our hearts and our mind, Lord, to receive it. Lord, pray for the offering. Pray for the teaching in your word, Lord. Pray you be with us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
that's beautiful music. Shannon McDonald's going to sing for us this morning. For those that don't know, that's my husband. We will be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary <laughs> on the 14th. And uh, he's just he's a wonderful husband. I hope you all get a blessing out of this song. So here we go. it was. I've known her a long time. She's had a lot of physical ailments in the last few years, a lot of suffering and so forth. And uh, it took a lot for her to get up here and sing like that this morning. And God's given her a gift though. She can sing. And you, can, you saw it and God has blessed through her. Amen. All right. This morning, if you have your Bible, we turn to the book of Genesis chapter number 50. Genesis chapter number 50 and verse number 15. 
And while you're turning there, I'd like to give an invitation for a couple of women in our church, two women that would like to make a visit to a widow who has just become a widow in the last few weeks and to show some Christian love and compassion. And if you can do that, meet me after the service this morning for just a moment and I'll tell you who it is. And uh, a couple of women would be good to make a visit like that. All right, Genesis chapter number 50 and verse number 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger to Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Father, bless your holy word now, thy blessed word, as it goes forth for the purpose that you intend it. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. What you just read took place a little over 3,700 years ago. So by taking this and comparing it with the contemporary world that you live in, you'll see that things really haven't changed. People are still people. They still view things the same way. They still have the same fears, doubts, wickedness, and guile, and so forth about them. They never did trust their brother Joseph until Joseph finally revealed himself unto them to show them who he truly was. The reason for that is because they had been eaten up with guilt. And because the guilt had settled down into their soul, they knew what they had done to their brother was terrible and it was wrong. As you know the story of the Bible, you know how they sold their brother into Egyptian slavery. They sold him to Ishmaelites who eventually took him into Egypt and sold him. He was sold into the house of Potiphar. And I won't go into all the detail because I've got a lot to cover this morning, but you know the story he was put into a dungeon. And that in, there in that dungeon, God who gave him dreams in his father's home continued to be with him and never forsook him. And Joseph was able to look beyond what could be seen with a natural eye. And God raised him from the dungeon to the right hand of Pharaoh himself gave him vision therefore through that vision through that dream God was able to save not only the Egyptians but he was able to save his own people the Israelites and so Joseph saw all of that when it came to him to understand that God meant all of this for good I cannot say the moment that happened but I do know this Joseph never gave up his trust in Jehovah he never one time turned from him Joseph was faithful Faithful to God all the days of his life. Joseph, as you know in the Bible, is one of the greatest types of Christ that we find in the Old Testament. What's a type? A type is someone or a thing, a place, a person that speaks in the Old Testament of something of the New Testament. It may reveal a good bit about it, may reveal only part of it. And so what we find in Joseph is many things about his life are like our Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, there are two lines of Messiah in the Bible. One is Mashiach von uh, Mashiach ben Joseph and the other one is Mashiach ben David and these two lines of the, of the Messiah one has to do with his suffering and the other has to do with his reigning as the king just drop that with you for a moment we'll get into that in a few minutes but what you're looking at here in the Old Testament is a story about a man who gave his life completely in her service to the Lord in the place that God put him and he said well you say well now his brethren sold him yes they did but nothing can happen nothing not even as much as a hair of your head can be touched outside of the permissive will of almighty god amen, amen. no weapon formed against you shall prosper because
because the Almighty wakes you in the morning and puts you to sleep at night, and you live by Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. Stuff will come into your life. Sorrow will come upon you. You'll suffer. You'll have pain and woe and this and that and so forth. But the Apostle Paul said, none of these things move me. Amen. He said, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith be content. Now, he wasn't told that. He didn't read a lot about that. He learned it, he said, from experience in his walk with God. Amen. So when you think God has forsaken you and you think the Lord has, has uh, you know, turned his back upon you, no, he hasn't. He has a greater purpose, and it, sometimes it may take him a while to reveal that purpose in your life, but he does have a reason for you being here. And the greatest purpose of all, the greatest uh, to me, the greatest thing about life is the more that you might know about him. This is why the the Apostle Paul said that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He knew both ends, the power of his resurrection to see the miracles performed, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. And therefore we understand the Bible says he that is born of woman is a few days and full of sorrows. The sparks fly upward. We know that if you've lived any length of time on this earth, you know that this world is full of suffering. No question about it. And if you've matured any in your lifetime and learned anything about life and you know anything about the grace of God, you will not add to the sufferings of another fellow human being. Amen. You want no part of it. What you'll do for them is to try to bear their burdens, pray for them, and help them through whatever the circumstance and situation that they are in. So we have a wonderful picture here in Joseph. And Joseph is one of those men in the Bible that I hold in very high esteem, folks, very high. Joseph, this is the son of, uh, what was his mother's name, by the way? She had two children. Uh, who? Right. Yeah. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And Jacob had Leah, and one baby after another came. Uh, you remember that? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, the firstborn. But he also had another wife, and her name was Rachel, and she was beautiful, and he loved her. And Leah had, the Bible said she had, what was it kind of eyes she had? That's right, and I'm reminding you and refreshing your memory of the Bible. And so this is the woman that he loved. When Leah had her children, she said, now maybe my husband will love me as she continued to have the children. God opened the womb of Leah because she wasn't loved like Rachel. The name Rachel in Hebrew literally means a snare because she was so beautiful. And this, of course, swept Jacob away while he was in the home of, of uh, Laban up in Syria. So we have Joseph, and Joseph, my dear friend, is loved of his father Jacob. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ is loved of his father. Amen. God the Father. Amen, amen, amen. Now I want to take you into some prophecy, if you will, with me. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 45, and verses 1 through 5, the Bible says he could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. He cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Now this is a picture in the Old Testament, a type of what's going to happen very soon when the Lord Jesus Christ makes himself known again unto his brethren. Listen, the Jew is the chosen people, folks. Now, you might, you might not like that. A lot of people don't like that. But the truth of the matter is, everything that's happening today, if you'll notice carefully, you look at what's going on in Jerusalem, and you see how prophecy is coming together. It's fantailing. It's coming together. There's a reason for this. And, uh, and you're watching it happen. In fact, the matter is, you're watching it accelerate before your very eyes. And sometimes I marvel and how quickly stuff begins to fall in place. And what you have here is Jews who don't believe in Christ. They, they've rejected him. And we'll talk about that in a moment and some of the reasons why. But the point of the matter, the point is that the Jew is the focus of attention of everything now. It's what's going on over there. This is in Gaza. They're, they've got their tanks in there. and The people are dying. They're demonstrating in the streets by the tens of thousands. A hundred and something thousand in London, England alone uh, demonstrated against the Jews and demonstrating for the Palestinians. Now that's a long thing to get into where they got the word Palestinian, what that means, and uh, end of World War I and the creation of Jordan, and that was the home of the Palestinian and all of that. We won't get into all that this morning. Just want you to know, it's not as simple as you get from the newspaper when you pick it up and read it or from the mainstream media. It's not that simple. There's a whole lot going on over there. 
But the bottom line, all attention on this earth is focused toward Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city, the great city of peace. So the Bible says here, he made himself known unto his brethren. Now, this is what I want to talk to you about for just a moment this morning. It's when he makes himself known. Somebody said, well, when are the Jews, so when are they going to get saved? Well, they've always, there's always been a remnant throughout every generation of Jews who are saved. And this is what it tells you in the book of Romans, plainly, chapter number 11. For a remnant, there will be a remnant according to election. And this is one of those aspects of election in the Bible. There are many different types of election in the Bible, by the way. These Jews that are elected, they're el they are the elect. They have been called out from every generation to believe in Christ, but the whole nation itself is an elect nation. And they are enemies of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet they're the elect nation. That's something to think about, don't you think? So he's going to reveal himself to them. Here's a prophecy in the book of Hosea chapter 2. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. This is speaking far forward into the future in the book of Hosea about the time when he's going to begin to deal with her, with Israel. In the book of Ezekiel chapter number 20, verse number 35, he said, And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. That has never happened, folks. You look at scripture and prophecy and you say to yourself, has this happened? No, it hasn't happened. He hasn't brought them into the wilderness yet to plead face to face. But then he says, I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Now look at that, the covenant, the covenant that is mentioned in the book of Hebrews chapter number eight, the covenant, the new covenant. This is the covenant for the Jew. You see, we are under what's called the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, which is part of the new covenant. But you see, the new covenant has yet to been has yet to be completely filled up, if you please, or fulfilled as you please, because until it is filled up with the Jew themselves, which enjoy the benefits of that new covenant, it is still unfulfilled. So the Bible says that I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. And I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and ye shall know that I am the Lord. This is important. He said, I will come face to face with you. Now look at Matthew chapter number 24, a New Testament scripture. As the scriptures continued, con they, 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 they complement each other. Matthew 24 verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, when Daniel prophesied of the abomination of desolation, a lot of folks think that that was fulfilled with the Antiochus Epiphanes. When he went into the temple, killed a swine on the altar during the time of the Maccabees, during the period between Malachi and Matthew, that 400 silent years, as it is called. It was not. That was a type of it. Yes, here we are in typology again. But why, if it was fulfilled, is the Lord Jesus telling them? Him, that it's yet to come. See what he says plainly, it's yet to come. In Matthew chapter number 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, so the Lord Jesus believed Daniel was a prophet, although liberal theology doesn't, they don't believe Daniel even existed. But the Lord Jesus called him a prophet. You know why? Because he existed and he is a prophet. And stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them be in Judea, flee into the mountains. Now look at Luke chapter 21 that compliments the same thing. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days for there shall be great distress in the land, wrath upon this people and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive to all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now we've got a time, a chronology. We've got something locked in place. So what is the times of the Gentiles, preacher? It started in the plains of Dura in 606 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar saw this great image and there a head of gold and winds up with feet of iron and clay and mixed it 
talking about the Gentile kingdoms as they run in succession one after another. This is important about the times of the Gentiles. It has to do with Gentile kingdoms. And Gentile kingdoms are going to come to a catastrophic end. You are probably living in the generation when you watch Gentile kingdoms, folks, completely collapse before your very eyes. If you're left here, if you're going to call out with the Lord when he comes to get us, then you're not going to be seeing that. But the people alive at that time will watch the Gentile kingdoms come falling down. And this is called the times of the Gentiles. Now, there's a difference between the times of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles is a broader spectrum. It has more to do with the Gentiles' relationship with Israel, their place in the world, and when God's finished dealing with them and focuses his attention on the Jew. And that's coming because when you read the book of Revelation, you talk about 144,000 male Jewish virgins and names the 12 tribes of Israel. The book of Revelation is not about the church of the living God. It's about the Jew on this earth. That's what Revelation's about. And if you don't get that right, you get so messed up. It's not funny. You've got people today up here preaching to people, telling them to get ready that the church is going to go into the tribulation period. No, you're not. You're going up. You're not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation at the shout of God he comes to receive us into himself the, 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 the time of, the book of Revelation the seven years is called the time of Jacob's trouble not the time of the church of the living God so let's look at this now I know I'm covering a lot of ground I realize we're moving fast through this <coughs> but we have to get through and put it together for you now, Matthew chapter number 25, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like the ten virgins. How many's ever heard a message about the ten virgins? Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Notice carefully, they, will, they go forth to meet the bridegroom. And five were wise and five foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while their bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Now, folks, that's not the rapture. That's not the rapture. That's not the Lord coming back to catch up his saints, to meet him in the clouds and in the air. Notice carefully, there's something they have to do. There's something they have to do to be prepared. And there's something about the bridegroom coming. And then there's something about him tarrying. Now, what I personally believe, now you may not have to believe this, but I believe in the tribulation period that we're talking about here, the Lord is going to come and reveal himself to the Jews during this tribulation period. And when he reveals himself to the Jews during this tribulation period, they're going to have to prepare themselves for the actual advent, second coming of the Lord himself when he comes in power and great glory. And these appearances of Christ to his people is when they understand what it tells you in the book of Zechariah chapter number 12. Because they see him and here's what's going to happen. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall they there be a great morning in Jerusalem as in the morning of Hadadrimon in the valley of Megiddo. You know what that is? That is in typology, in, in, in the fulfillment of the coming of the Lord in typology is when Joseph revealed himself to his brethren and did they ever mourn? You better believe they did. They wept greatly. So when's the Jew going to be saved, preacher? He's going to be saved when Christ comes and appears to him personally and he has to give an account where did you get these wounds? What happened to you? I mean, what's going on here? I got them on the cross <laughs> at the hands of my friends. Your generation, the, pre the generations that preceded you 2,000 years ago, nailed me to the tree. And boy, will they ever begin to mourn. And then they'll begin to understand something that they should have already known because if they've studied their Bible, they know this fact. Listen to what a very well-read rabbi, now we're talking about a Jewish rabbi, says. There are two very distinct lines of prophecy in the scriptures concerning the Messiah. One line portrays him as a humble suffering savior. The other line of prophecy depicts him as a conquering king redeemer. 
These two competing functions of the Messiah are recognized in Talmudic in the Talmud and other Jewish sources. One explanation invoked to resolve this dilemma was that there would be two messiahs, one who would suffer and be humbled and one who would rule and be exalted. The suffering Messiah was referred to as Mashiach ben Yosef. Zechariah was said to have prophesied concerning him, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a colt. Here's the problem. There are not two Messiahs. No, 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 no. Here's the problem. Not two Messiahs, just one. Look over here in the book of Luke now. Chapter number 24. And verse number 25. Luke 24, 25. I was listening to a rabbi. I get on YouTube and I listen to the rabbis. And there's one on there. I forget his name now. He's one of the smartest Jews out there. He's very, very, very smart. And he, and, and I, I love to watch him debate a woker. <laughs> I don't know what the term, best term to use. You know, wokeism? How many know what wokeism is? <laughs> and boy, I'm telling you, if you want to see somebody torn all two pieces, watch one of them as they, what's his name? Shapiro. Ben, ben Shapiro. He's not a Christian. He's, he's not your friend when it comes to Christ. But uh, he, 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 he is very, very, very smart. And when he did, and they don't, if they don't know who they're dealing with, they're ready for butchery because he will dissect them. And I've watched them as they literally, some of them wilt right before him because they can't handle his logic and his reasoning. But here's the point. Here's the point. Look what it says in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And did the Lord Jesus Christ always say, search the scriptures? And beginning at Moses and the prophets. So he believed in the Pentateuch, didn't he? Genesis, Section Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Moses. For the books of Moses, they're called. The Pentateuch is called the first five books, the books of Moses. So look what he says. O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Now look at this. Ought not Christ to have suffered? these things and to enter into his glory see the suffering messiah but it's the same person go on down with me verse number 46 luke chapter number 24 and said unto them thus it is written and thus it behooved christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things amen folks the lord jesus christ has fulfilled mashiach ben yosef he is going to come as mashiach ben david as the messiah the son of david he's coming how do you know he's the son of David? Read Matthew chapter number one. It's plain. The genealogy is laid out there for you. Amen. And I'm not going to get into the reigning Messiah this morning. I've got too much to cover. But I'm going to tell you something. He's coming again. He said, if I go away, I'll come again. Receive into myself that where I am, there you may be also. The disciples said to him in Acts chapter one, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Would you do it now? We want it now. And he said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. God will do that. He'll say when that's going to happen. And it will. It's to come. And he will restore it. Remember, the times of the Gentiles are going to collapse. A stone cut out of a mountain will smite the image, not on its, on its knees or its legs, on its feet, its very foundation, and it'll come tumbling down. And what happens when that happens? Israel will become the head of all the nations and go into the millennium and the son of david the reigning ruling lord jesus christ will sit down in jerusalem and he'll reign over the house of israel that's coming now sure as you hear me that's coming but this is important here this is important he made it plain to them that the first time he came he did not come to reign he came to suffer they needed a savior you see, the Jews today, if you talk to them, they, they talk about a world of peace. They talk about a time of prosperity. They talk about what the Messiah is going to bring. He's going to bring all these blessings and all of this to the earth. But they don't say anything about their sin problem. Your problem is not the money in your po po pocket. Your problem is sin. You see, sin is the issue. God had to, de to, to deal with the sin issue first. This is why John the Baptist 
when he saw him coming. What did he call him? Did he say this is the king? No, what did he call him? He said the what? Lamb of God that does what? Taketh away the sin of the world. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ye straight the way of the Lord. He was the servant of the Lord that you read in the first part of the second part of the book of Isaiah from chapter 40 on. He's the servant of God. John the Baptist, the Lamb of God. Now I want you to come with me this morning as we move a little further into a few things. I've laid a foundation for you and I want you to begin to think with me. Did you know that the Muslims believe in Jesus? I may know that. You mean they believe in my Lord Jesus Christ? No, I didn't say that. See, this is where you get into what's called semantics. All right. Okay. One word means one thing. You mean something else to someone else. They believe in Issa, the son of Mary or Miriam. All right. They believe that Jesus is a prophet who lived 2,000 years ago and he was the son of Mary. All right. Are they, is, that, is that correct? Would you have any of you agree with that? I agree fully with it. He is a prophet, and he lived 2,000 years ago, and he was the son of Mary. They also believe he's a prophet. They believe that uh, he preached submission to Allah while he was here 2,000 years ago. And who is Allah? Well, Allah is the Arabic for God. That's a different study in itself altogether, but let's just leave it at that this morning, that he preached submission to Allah. You read, do a little research into Islam, and you'll find out that a lot of Muslims like the Beatitudes. They like the Beatitudes. Say, so what are the Beatitudes? I mean, you know what the Beatitudes are. Yeah. Blessed are this, and blessed this, and blessed that's what it means. That's, that's what it is. All right, now where's that? That's the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, okay? Now, how many of you know that the New Testament is a chronological book? How many of you know that the New Testament is a book of progressive revelation? How many of you understand that when uh, Priscilla and Aquila went to Apollos out there preaching and knowing on the baptism of John, you see the progression? They went to him and said, well, now what you're preaching was true for its time, but there's more to it now. More has happened. And they told him that Christ had come. He died. He rose again the third day, gave him the gospel of Christ. And so what did Apollos do? He did what anyone would do who had the Holy Ghost upon him. He believed the truth. That's what he did. And from that day forth, he went out preaching the truth. No problem. No problem whatsoever. All right. So that's progressive revelation. So you do not preach the Beatitudes to people to get them saved, do you? Are the Beatitudes true? Absolutely. But it has to do with the kingdom of heaven. And it has to do with the context of it. All right. But why would they do that? Why would the Muslim like the Beatitudes? Blessed this, blessed. You know, I'm going to tell you one of the reasons there's no cross in it. There's no blood atonement in it. Are you saying that it doesn't teach? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, <laughs> buckle up. There's more revealed, but it takes time to reveal it. They also teach that the Apostle Paul was an heretic of the first order, that he created his own brand of Christianity, and that he, what he preaches, what Paul preaches, has nothing to do with the real Christ of 2,000 years ago. Now, folks, that's important. Who else teaches that? A lot of people teach that today. I have never seen such an assault on the Apostle Paul as I'm seeing today. They believe in Jesus. They believe he's a prophet. Not your Lord Jesus Christ now. Please don't, you know, don't take me out of context. They believe in their Jesus, that he's a prophet. They believe he's coming back. They're looking for the Mahdi. The Mahdi is a deliverer who's coming back to the earth. But Jesus is also going to come. They believe in a false Christ. They believe in an antichrist. What? You mean the Muslim believes in an antichrist? Yes, yes. They believe in an antichrist. They believe that Jesus is going to come, and when he comes, he's going to come against the Antichrist, and he's going to essentially destroy him. And then when he comes back, he's going to tear down the cross, and he's going to tell Christians, people like us who believe that Christ is the Son of God, they don't believe that for one minute. He's the Son of Mary, but he's not the Son of God. 
the Jesus of Islam, remember now, get in context, that he, they do not believe he's the son of God. They're going to, he's going to tear down the cross and he's going to preach to the whole world that they submit. That's what Muslim is. He's a submitter. He submits to Islam. All right. He submits to Allah. And the, the, he's going to preach that that he's going to submit to Allah. And depending on what source you read, some say that he will reign on this earth for 40 years and then die at the end of 40 years. There's some disagreement. And there seems to be no real consistency in a lot of the stuff that they believe. But the point is this. I got to thinking to myself. Uh, what's the big difference between the Jesus of Islam and the Christ that the Jew has no use for? You see, there's an awful lot. Do you ever, how many's ever heard of the Passover plot? Well, there's a book written by a Jew years ago. Thesis was that when Christ or Jesus was nailed on a cross, that he didn't really die, that he was he was he was was given uh, like a narcotic or whatever, put him in a passive state, and so he kind of swooned on the cross. They took him down and put him in a cold place, and he was revived a few days later and carried him away and he lived out his life and and of course you got the Merovingians over here in Europe who teaches that he and Mary Magdalene had children. How many ever heard of this stuff I'm talking about here this morning? Now how many of you think about what I'm talking about how they're messing with the gospel? You remember Dan Brown? What is that? Wasn't that his name? The the uh, uh, what's it called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The Merovingian bloodline, a direct descendant of the Lord Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. Well, that's blasphemy, folks. Amen. But here's the problem. He said, when the Son of God came, they rejected him. But one will come in his own name, and you'll receive him. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, that there's another Jesus, there's another Christ, there's another gospel, there's another spirit, there's another, 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 another. So how do you live today? Here you are in 2024. How do you know that you are worshiping the true Christ? You need some identifying factors, don't you? All right, before I jump into that, I want you to think for a moment. The Bible says that the Jew is going to make a covenant with death and hell. He's going to sign a covenant with death and hell. He wants peace at any cost. He wants peace. Might be quite a thing for him to uh, sign some kind of a covenant with a false Christ, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be something? That'd be something to think about. But you see, the Lord Jesus is going to appear to them because you see, when he walks into the temple and professes to be God, that's the abomination of desolation. The Jews are going to flee from Jerusalem. And when he flees, that's when the Lord Jesus meets him in the wilderness and comes face to face with him. He'll come face to face with him. And from that moment on, he'll understand that he's believed the wrong thing. And the true Christ came 2,000 years ago and fulfilled the scripture. And that's exactly what he did. But you've got churches today full of people today who do not even believe in the deity of Christ. They don't believe in the deity of Christ. They don't believe in the inspiration of scripture. They believe that a Christ is Christ-like spirit can come upon anybody. And that therefore anything can be a Messiah. If you remember, it says in Revelation chapter number 13 that we're looking at a false Christ, aren't we? Yeah, pseudo Christ, a false Christ. Many Christ shall arise and say, I am Christ. I am this, I am that. So how do you know that you're believing in the true Christ this morning? Number one, 2,000 years ago, God opened heaven and God became a man. If you don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ is almighty God manifest in flesh, you're not a Christian and you're ready for the Antichrist. Number two, he lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth, sinless, perfect. And when he went to the cross, he died as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And upon him was laid the sin of the world, every sin, everything, and all that sin is in its essence and whatever it is, he became sin for us who knew no sin. Therefore, the issue of sin is settled with Christ. When someone tries to say, oh, Christ is good, that's okay, you need him, but no, that but right there takes you off into damnation. Christ is the end of the law for all that believe. Number three. He died on the cross. He didn't swoon on the cross. He literally died. He gave his life. He died, and they laid him in a tomb. 
And for three days and three nights, his body lay in that tomb. His soul went on down to Abraham's bosom. But for three days and three nights, his body lay in that tomb. Then on the third day, hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Praise God. If this hadn't happened, you'd have no hope today. Hallelujah. On the third day, he said, come here, touch me. A spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see. Amen. They thought they were looking at a spirit, you know, a ghost. The Lord Jesus was physically alive in their presence. He arose from the dead on the third day. So if your Christ did not rise from the dead, became sin for us who knew no sin, my friend, you got the wrong Christ. And then 40 days later, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's coming again to receive us into himself. Now, here's the final one. If you believe in the true Christ, if you've accepted the real Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've changed. You've got the Holy Ghost in you. You've changed. And if you didn't change, you don't know the real one. You've got the spirit of this world. Have you changed, dear friend? Have you really changed? If you think about the rapture happening today, and I think about it a lot when I get up in the morning, does it scare you to death or does it kind of put a, put a, put a, put a, a just a little beat, a little, little movement in your soul to think, ah, it could be, before this sun goes down, we could be with him today. Amen. Amen. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Do you know him? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you really know him? I hope you do. Because, let me tell you something, I just gave you a little snippet. I just jumped here, jumped there. There's so much stuff going on today, it absolutely blows my mind. I find this quite remarkable, of the similarity between the Muslim Jesus and the Jew, what he thinks about Jesus. That's got to be a reason for that, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Like the law says, you get a hold of a detective, he says, there is no such thing as coincidence. What a thought. Father, bless your word. In thy holy name I pray. And the heads are bowed this morning, and if you think about it, this may be our last day on planet Earth. Are you ready? I hope you are. What can I do? You can't do anything, it's already been done. You just accept the one who's already done it. That's what you do. You believe on him, trust him from your heart, call into his name. Can you do that? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shalt be saved. Philippian jailer, what must I do? Philippi, Philippian jailer, Gentile, what must I do to be saved? The apostle said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's what he said. That's all, believe. John wrote that whole gospel, said, these things are written that you might believe. Believe. New Testament faith. Pistuo. Trust. Faith. Put your trust in. Trust him. Call upon him. Listen, to the fellow this morning talk about how you can be, how that the baptism is necessary for salvation. You know what you do when you hear that? You ask that thief on the cross. Well, why is it in the Bible? That's a progressive thing. That's progressive, folks. There's a reason for it being there, but it only lasted so long. Have you been saved? Are you born again? Let's stand up. What have you got, brother? Page number 373. Pass me Savior, Savior.
Folks, the mark of the beast is coming. I don't know what it is, but I know it's the mark of the beast. When we find out who the beast is, we'll know what his mark is. Right? That's right. It's his mark. That's right. And who's the beast? Well, the beast is Satan incarnate. That's who he is. He mimics the incarnation of God. It's called the mystery of iniquity. That's what's going on. Amen. The mystery of iniquity. Let's sing another verse, brother. Appreciate you listening to me this morning. I, uh, when you study the Bible and you study these things, you learn stuff. I covered a lot of ground, but there's an awful lot that I didn't cover that I've studied this past week. Some of it will blow your mind. A lot of these, uh, you'll hear these Jewish uh, rabbis on YouTube and all of this say so, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, say with such uh, conviction. Uh, oh, Christ uh, Jesus is not our Messiah because he failed to do what he was supposed to do when he was here 2,000 years ago and named it off. As if to say, this is the final authority and this is what all the Jews believe. And people buy into that. All you have to do is just a little bit of research and you'll find out that the Jews for a long time have believed that there is the only way they could see it would be two Messiahs. They can't see that Christ is the fulfillment of all of it. One man suffering and reigning. He's coming. We'll meet again this evening, six o'clock for the evening service. Don't forget now, if a couple of ladies like to meet with me and, uh, and, and make a visit to a widow, I think it'd be a wonderful thing to, to get that done. Yes, ma'am. All right, five o'clock this afternoon, play practice. Let's keep that in mind. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, let's pray. All you folks visiting with us today, we're glad to have you. Good to have you. God bless you. Y'all come back when you can. Father, thank you for your word, the time we've had in your house, for the blessedness of the sweet Holy Spirit. Keep the folks safe now as they travel from here and bring them back again safe this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.